O Holy Spirit of God, take our ears and hear through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. Amen. Please be seated. There is something in us that loves the idea of a conspiracy. It may be true, especially in a political season, a gathering of folks who hold a common vision of what they are seeing in the world and are determined to respond to it. If we get rid of the negative connotations, a conspiracy is what we have this morning because the real meaning of the world is to, of the word, is to breathe together, to gather in the same place and feel the breath and the movement of God among us. Even if we don't understand it, it is impossible to ignore. And whether it happens between two of us or in a gathering of a hundred or more, it is a reminder of two things. It is a reminder of the inscrutable presence of God. And in contrast to the conspiracies we feel we know, when it appears as the Spirit of God, there is little we can do except to recognize it as something we cannot control. We can only feel its presence, how it changes us and everything around us. And for those of us, who pray for the church and the work of the Spirit in our lives, we pray that we might bear the Spirit of God into the world just as those completely unremarkable people took it from Jerusalem and spread it throughout the world. Even now, as we spread it around these walls and all the places and lives we touch. But that cannot have been the thoughts of these men on Pentecost morning, just after Jesus had ascended into heaven, promising the guidance of the Advocate, but not suggesting what they might be looking for. It was after they had found Matthias to complete their number. After following the death of Judas, and that is what they wanted, after all, completeness, especially in the, faith of so, in, in, in the face of so much they could not explain, where the death and, re and resurrection of a beloved teacher had changed everything for them. They were seeking something stable to hang on to, something that felt like normalcy, a community of 12 that had been the focus of their lives long enough for them to realize that they could not go back to the way things were. And if we are honest, it is not so different for us. The way we crave normalcy when everything else around us feels so uncertain, when all else feels at the whim of numbers and people and circumstances that we cannot understand much less trust or predict. Predictability is not what they have this morning. What they have are divided tongues of fire resting on each of them and the sound of a violent wind. It isn't an accident if we are reminded of the wind moving through chaos over the waters at the beginning of creation. It is because every movement of God in our lives together is about God's continuous act of creation, the working out of God's plan in our lives and the lives of the people we love. It is the very unpredictability of our lives together that is the sign of how deeply God is embedded in them, changing the way we look at one another and the work that we do in the world. Maybe that is why I have such sympathy for those in the crowd who sneer 
at what they are hearing. Languages from all the known world coming from these most ordinary men. They are trying to frame the work of God in some kind of context that makes sense, even if it is unflattering to these men who don't understand what is happening. It is Peter who tries to help them make sense of it all, that God will pour out his spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. But it is, it is a prophet's explanation, and it is maddeningly unhelpful to those of us who want to chart a course for the church. For those who pretend that the church's responsibility is to conform to our own private agendas. Pentecost is a reminder that it is not we who work with the Spirit of God, that it is we who work with the Spirit of God and not the other way around. We have a responsibility as stewards of the church to make the best decisions we can with our resources. But it is our attentiveness to the movement of the Spirit that will tell us how faithful we are. What does this mean, they ask? What does it mean to have the Spirit of God blowing through us, all around us, putting us in situations we cannot understand, much less control? One of the great gifts of how we are shaped is that sooner or later, we have to exhale. We are hardwired, like everyone else on the planet, to breathe into the world however we can, knowing that beyond our best intentions, the great part of what all of us go through is simply not under our control. I don't know about the rest of you, but the most wonderful moments in our ministries for me the ones that are truly breathtaking are the ones where it all can seem like chaos, when order dissolves in front of us and it seems as though everyone is speaking all at once in a different language. It is then that we have a choice. We can hold our collective breath and hope we can simply get through it, or we can decide to breathe together knowing that we cannot control the outcome, but know that God is in the middle of it, asking us only to be open to God's breath and the wonderfully chaotic gift of those around us. One thing that makes it so hard to talk about the Holy Spirit, to begin to understand what it means, is that we tend to treat it as a private event or even as a personal attribute something we have or we don't. We all have experiences in our lives that we cannot understand. The relationship restored with a son or a daughter or a parent that seemed beyond redeeming. The meeting you fear because you know that there will be as many different opinions as people. And somehow consensus emerges or more ideas than you could have imagined. The Holy Spirit works among us in ways that stretch us, remind us that our hearts have to be bigger than what we think they can be. William Sloan Coffin, the late great pastor of Riverside Church in New York, spoke about the need to broaden our hearts to accommodate the love of God. If indeed we love the Lord our God with all our hearts, minds, and strength, he says, we are going to have to stretch our hearts, open our minds, and strengthen our souls, whether our years are three score and ten or not yet twenty. God cannot lodge in a narrow mind. God cannot lodge in a small heart. To accommodate God, they must be palatial. Indeed, the Holy Spirit is not a private identification card for our spirituality, 
but shows us how unbelievably large God's love is for all of us and how large our hearts have to be in return. It's worth remembering for those of us who are longing for something that feels like normalcy because we are not called to be normal. Like Peter the tax collector, Matthew the tax collector, Peter the rock, and the numberless saints that have come after them, we are unremarkable and extraordinary at the same time. The mission with, that we have on this day and each day forward is seeking out the spirit among us, seeing where it is drawing us. And if we need something to hang on to, let it be the idea that we cannot be who we are meant to be without letting go, letting go of our need for explanations and letting the spirit of God give us tongues to speak and breathe all we are into divine life. So the calendars will tell you that the rest of the Sundays after Pentecost will happen in ordinary time, but don't you believe it? There is nothing ordinary about the love of a God who causes this blessed chaos in our lives, whose spirit blows through everything we do and are. All it takes is a little training to learn to exhale when things feel a little dicey. Mostly what we need, though, is to expand our hearts, to take in all this blessed, messy, chaotic love. What we will experience in our lives will often seem completely out of our control, but believe it or not, it is supposed to feel that way. And if we do believe it, we might find that we have our souls, our hearts, even our heads on fire with love for this God. Amen.